All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chow Down with Chow, the only podcast where you can hear the word Chow twice in the title. So this is going to be a uh, extension to the Chow Down Chow MMA show number one, hastily done. Uh, as you can see from the Family Guy shirt, you know, I didn't even take the time to dress up. So, you know, this is going to be a shitty extension, but UFC 249. You know, uh, last time, I, based on the information I got, I covered the card for y'all and gave y'all my predictions. But now the full card has since been exposed, and there are a lot of fights that I didn't get to cover, and uh, a lot of fights that I think are going to be fantastic. And I want you to know that I was right from the beginning, so that's why I'm recording this weird extension of an episode, because I want to cover those fights. So I took the liberty of pulling out the full fight card, and I'm going to go through the uh, fights that I didn't get to cover in the first episode of the podcast. Um, So, uh, by the way, um, when UFC 249 is happening, me and my buddy Ryan, we're going to do a live watch along with an audio version of the podcast live, so be uh, be sure to tune in to that. And we're also going to do a... um, and uh, an episode of the podcast right afterwards where we break down all the fights on the card and give you our instant analysis on what we uh, saw during UFC 249. So be sure to tune into that as well. So without further ado, let me pull up the card and uh, give you my thoughts on some of the fights that I didn't get to cover and um, my predictions on them. So I've covered Ferguson Gaethje, I've co- uh, covered Cejudo Cruz. Uh, one thing about the Ngannou Rosenstrike fight that I wanted to talk about, a lot of people has been clamoring for it to be an interim title shot. I don't think that's a great idea. I think Stipe didn't do anything wrong. He hasn't been out for that long. So, you know, I, I get why Jarzinho would want it to be an interim title shot. It would seriously strengthen his claim to the throne if it does become an interim title shot but i don't think it should be don't think it would be and um that's that my prediction stands and now a a great fight on the main card kelvin cater versus jeremy stevens so if you look at both of their previous fight kelvin cater lost a decision to uh zabit magomesharipov and Jeremy Stevens lost a decision to Yair Rodriguez. It's very similar fights, if you look at it. They both sort of got technically outclassed in the beginning, but then grinded it out, and in the second and third round found their wins, but it wasn't enough, and they lost the decision. Two very tough and durable gentlemen throwing everything out there, everything on the line. I read this thing once about Jeremy Stevens, about how he has one of the worst records in the UFC, yet he's headlining events. Um, That's because he fights like a maniac. He goes out there and he puts everything on the line. Same thing for Kelvin Cater. Kelvin Cater is one of the the most incredible smooth boxing games in all of MMA. And Jeremy Stevens throws elbows from hell. All right, I think it's going to be a war. I think it's going to be one of those fights where I don't anticipate a finish, but both men are going to come out with their face battered, blood trickling down their nose and shit like that. It's going to be a war of attrition. And I think ultimately, Calvin Cater is probably more young, probably more hungry, and uh, willing to do whatever it takes to sort of step up to that ladder again. I know he wants a title shot. He wants another chance to climb up that ladder. In terms of Jeremy Stevens, I think he's going to give Calvin all he can handle, but I think if you look at it, he's a 50-50 fighter ultimately, and um, he'll probably lose a decision, so I, I'm going to go with Calvin Cater, split decision, I think it's going to be a close, close fight um, after three rounds. Next fight, Greg Hardy versus Jorgen DeCastro, Hardy coming off a loss against Alexander Volkov, DeCastro coming off a win against Justin, Justin Taffa, where he knocked him out with one punch. Um, but if you really think about it, we haven't seen DeCastro in the octagon that much. He, um, he caught someone, he knocked him out, he's shown he has power, but Greg Hardy, he already has like two TKO wins, 
and a um, and he went five rounds with Alexander Volkov, which is one of the most technically sound heavyweights in the world. So we know Greg Hardy can take a punch. We know he's durable. We also know he has the power to knock people out. All we know about the Castro is that he can knock people out. So it's a pick and fight. I know with these 265 pound men throwing bombshells at each other, you can never guarantee anything. That's why I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna tell you. What I think is going to happen is Greg Hardy is going to knock DeCastro out. I think DeCastro is going to catch him. I think uh, Hardy could survive it and knock him out. It's going to be one of those sprint of a fight. It's going to end in round one TKO Greg Hardy. I really like watching wrestling, so I'm going to use a metaphor. It's going to be like that WrestleMania match between Goldberg and Brock Lesnar. Um, it's just going to be, you know, boom, kill shots, boom, kill shots, boom, kill shots. And then one man's going to come out standing, and that man's going to be Greg Hardy, in my opinion. All right, so next up, I've covered Pettis Cerrone. Another great fight I'm really, really interested in is Vicente Luque versus Nico Price. Nico, the hybrid price. So Vicente Luque coming off a loss against Steven Wonderboy Thompson. Um, but he showed this toughness in the fight. He went all three rounds with Steven Thompson, got bruised and battered, and dished out some punishment. One thing we know about Vicente is he's never going down, and he will do whatever it takes to put you down. And Nico Price has shown in the past that he can be put down. He's unpredictable. He throws the weirdest shit possible, coming off that up kick knockout of James Vick. So again, you can never count him out because he throws such unorthodox shit. But I don't think, like that same up kick, Vicente Luque wouldn't go out. He would just eat it. He'd come back. He'd swing at you all night. All right. So I think Nico Price is going to throw some weird shit. He's probably going to catch Vicente a couple times. But Vicente is coming back like a zombie and finishing him. So I'm going to call for a third round TKO Luque win. Nonetheless, it's going to be a great fight. It's going to be an absolute slugfest. It's going to be a war, so tune into that fight as well. All right, next up, a battle of ground masters. Fabricio Verdum coming off a two-year layoff after after, uh, getting knocked out by Alexander Volkov versus Alexei Olenek, who fought like a month ago, submitting Maurice Green with an armbar. So, um... I think it's going to be one of those classic bouts where a BJJ black belt meets another BJJ black belt or a wrestler meets another high-level wrestler and they just sort of cancel their um, abilities in that aspect out. So I think this fight is not going to be as exciting as we've seen. It's not going to be a lot of grappling exchanges. I think both know that they're in the most danger when they're on the ground. So they're not going to go to the ground. They're going to stand and they're going to strike. If you look at Olenek uh, in his fight against Alistair Overeem, you know he basically does nothing but span overhand, rights. He doesn't have a lot of polished striking game. But if you look at Verdum, he has shown in the past that he can knock people out. He has shown in the past that he has some boxing game to him. He used to be the heavyweight champion of the world. So, um... You know, if you look at the card, he's one of the biggest uh, fav- favorites on the card. I think rightly so. I think this fight is going to end up staying on the feet, which gives Fabricio Verdum um, the advantage. I think there's not going to be a finish in this fight. I think neither men have that power. So I'm going to do a unanimous decision win for Fabricio Verdum at the end of three rounds of standing around and spamming big punches okay now the next fight one that i'm very excited about because i love jacare is ronaldo jacare salsa versus uriah hall now if you look at uriah hall's record for the past few years he's sort of been a 50 50 fighter to be honest and he hasn't been fed a lot of high level opponents this uh besides gegar musasi uh, but you look at Jacare, he fought Jan Blachowicz, and he almost won that fight, to be honest. He fought Jack Hermanson, which weirdly got dominated on the ground, but still. He fought Jack Hermanson, which is a top-level middleweight, fought Chris Weidman. 
you know, fought all these killers in middleweight. And now he's coming back to his playground, which is middleweight. Again, I know Uriah Hall has the power to change anything. That's why if you look at the odds, it's a pick him fight. But if you look at Jacare, I think he has everything in his power to withstand whatever Uriah throws at him. And he can sort of cancel Uriah out on the feet. Because he has shown he can head kick your face off as well. He is not to be messed with on the feet. I think it's ultimately going to be taken to the ground. And I think Souza is going to end up submitting Uriah Hall. Adding to Uriah Hall's 50-50 record. So I'm going to predict a second round submission by Ronaldo Jacare Souza. I want him to do the alligator crawl again. I want him to make a statement back into the middleweight rankings. And I want him to take another shot at the, at the title. I think... If he wins tonight, uh, not tonight, at UFC 249, which I totally expect him to do, give him the winner of Weidman Hermanson. If it turns out to be Hermanson, do Jacare Hermanson too. Let him write that wrong. If it's Weidman, let him do Weidman Jacare too. Let Weidman write that wrong. Whoever wins goes on uh, higher on the middleweight rankings. I think that's only fair. I think that's only fair. Yeah, so second round submission for Jacare. Next up, a, uh, a, a women's strawweight bout between former champion Carla Esparza versus karate hottie Michelle Watterson. Um, so if you look at the odds, Carla Esparza is actually a modest favorite, probably because of her very impressive ground and wrestling top control game. But to be honest, if you look at the last fight Michelle Watterson was in, Versus Joanna Young Jacek, where first of all Michelle Watterson went all five rounds, fought Joanna tooth and nails, probably won a couple rounds as well. I think that in itself says a lot because if you look at how Joanna fared against Zhang Wei Li, this is the best Joanna we've seen in a while, and the fact that Watterson took her five rounds, won a couple rounds, proves that she's nothing to be messed with. She is much better than we expected. She's better on the ground than you think, first of all. She's better on the feet than you think, and she's tough as shit. So, although she is a slight underdog, I'm going to go with Michelle Watterson grinding out a unanimous victory win in this fight. Next, we got a couple of, you know, prelim fights. Uh, this is, all these fights that I just mentioned are on the prelims, but they do not seem like prelims fights, to be honest. Because this card, like I said, is stacked. Anyways, uh, Bryce Mitchell versus Charles Rosa. Bryce Mitchell, probably recency bias, came off of that uh, crazy twister win. So I'm going to go with Bryce Mitchell, um, unanimous decision win over Charles Rosa. Um, and then Ryan Spann, who just came off a... Uh, knockout win versus Sam Elvey, the old man Sam Elvey. And Ryan Spann is actually the biggest favorite on the card, and I wholeheartedly agree. I think he has that sort of game-changing power in the 205-pound division, and Sam Elvey in this situation is going to be a sacrificial lamb to who I think would uh, become one of the scariest men in the light heavyweight division, Ryan Spann, so I think Ryan Spann knocks Sam Alvey out uh, round one. No disrespect to Sam Alvey, he's done a lot for the sport, but I just think in this case, I see Ryan Spann taking the win. All right, so in this case, I think there's no more fights left to cover. So, like I said, be sure to tune into UFC 249. The card is stacked top to bottom. I think it's going to be a great night for the UFC and an even greater night to be an MMA fan. It's going to be insane. The whole world is going to be watching since it's quarantine. And like I said, me and my buddy, we're going to do a uh, live watch along, an audio version where uh, you can tune in and sort of add your instant reactions. And besides that, we're going to record a podcast right afterwards to give you our thoughts and our breakdown and our analysis of the fights that are happening. So be sure to tune into that as well. That's going to be a great time. I can't wait for UFC 249. And uh, yeah, so listen to my predictions. And I'm going to break down how many I got right, how many I got wrong. And uh, all in the after 
uh, the podcast right after UFC 249. So tune in then. Uh, so yeah, like I said, you can find our podcast on iTunes, on Spotify, it's on YouTube. If you watch the, if you want to watch the video version, be sure to tune in. I got s- loads of more content planned for y'all. So yeah, be sure to subscribe, like, and um, I'm gonna try to get this ugly, ugly Family Guy shirt out of your face for now. But yeah, so subscribe, and I will see you all later. Bye.